I'm Professor David Wilson. As a criminologist, I'm often asked, what's it like to interview a murderer? Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is audio taped. To answer this question, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting edge lip sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual taped confessions of some of the world's most notorious killers. I put tape on her mouth, help that there so she couldn't breathe. And bring you face to face with evil. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And along with forensic psychologist, Professor Michael Brooks, I'll analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there immediately unconscious. Their wicked words, now seen spoken for the very first time, will never be forgotten. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. in today's episode is one of the worst examples of a jilted lover turned revenge killer that I've ever come across. In the most shocking case of multiple partner violence in Canadian history, this 57-year-old man drove from house to house, fatally shooting two women and strangling another. The pattern of his crimes mean that we classify him as a spree killer someone who kills two or more victims in a short time in multiple locations. What makes this case particularly disturbing is that the killer was known to all of his victims and to the police for his long history of violence against women. He'd in fact only been freed from prison a matter of months before his bloody rampage. Not only are his crimes appalling, but so is his level of justification for having committed them. His police confession, which runs to over five hours, is a rambling and at times incoherent sermon filled with self-justification and an attempt to paint himself as a missionary killer, doing God's work and following the word of the scriptures. Hiding behind his religious belief, he interprets the pages of the Bible to serve his own hate-filled actions. Despite three women lying dead, he wants to paint himself as a victim, refusing to accept any blame whatsoever. So who is this scorned man for whom hell hath no fury? Basil Barutsky. On September 23rd, 2015, Basil Barutsky was led to an interview room by Ontario Provincial Police. It was the morning after he'd been arrested on suspicion of the murder of three of his former partners in a shocking one-day killing rampage in Renfrew County, Ontario. Just so you know, Basil, this room right now is being audio and video recorded. Is it okay to call you Basil? No, Basil. Basil? Do you know what your rights are, Basil? I mean, to remain silent. That thing. You're here trying to get me to say something to incriminate me in any way you possibly can. Well, that's not entirely true. My understanding of the reason that you're here today is that uh, yesterday you were arrested for murder times three. Basil Barutsky was convicted for the murders of three women in Canada. All three of these women were actually ex-girlfriends of his. My understanding is that the three individuals that uh, were murdered are Carol Culleton, Anastasia Kuziak, and Natalie Warmer. And those are the three individuals that were murdered and those are the three individuals that you've been arrested for, okay? So that's why you're here today. So do you understand that those are the charges that are being brought against you right now? Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about that? No, I didn't murder anybody. 
Basil Borodsky is an interesting case. He is a man who is a classic stalker in what he was doing. Having been rejected by several of his former lovers, he couldn't cope with that and ended up basically uh, taking their lives in revenge. Would you like to phone a lawyer? For killing, not murder. For killing, not murder, okay. And if you did understand that you'd know the difference between killing and murder, there's an awful big difference. He didn't see it murder as taking somebody's life, legally taking somebody's life, which is what he did. He just said, oh, under the Bible, killing and murder are two separate things. And I've killed these women, but I haven't murdered them. What's the difference between killing and murder? That was show, not murder. Commandments. Mm -hmm. So it's killing justified. Is that what you're getting at? I'm joined by Professor Michael Brooks, in his long and illustrious career as a prison psychologist, Michael has sat and listened to many murderers and experienced firsthand the mind games they'll play. That was shot murder. You know, th th this, is, this is very serious, this, uh, uh, and therefore one shouldn't in any way trivialize it. But do you think that Basil Barutsky is uh, a kind, caring, God-fearing human being. Not by his actions, no. And um, so by his actions, three women die. He refuses to call what happens to them, though, murder. He uses the word killing instead, and then cites there being a biblical reason for using that phrase. Well, he's seeking to justify his actions and to minimize what he did as the perpetrator and to put all the blame onto them and their actions and that they caused him to do this. I think he has deluded himself at this point to where he believes that the difference between murder and killing is that murder would be wrong and killing would be right. I think with a lot of serial killers, you tend to get them manipulating things like the Bible to their own needs. So they'll read into things that aren't ordinarily there that m most people would read and understand. It's interesting how you made the distinction between murder and killing. What that would suggest is that you have some kind of justification for what you've done, which it's also been my experience is always the case. He was brought up with a religious background, as would have been common at that time. And I think quite clearly he he's taken literal meanings out of the Bible. Uh, rather than actually look at the ethos behind his action. His presentation of Bible verses to justify what he's done is desperation. He needs to be the one in the right. That's absolutely typical of somebody whose life is shaped and driven by a revenge narrative. What matters to them above all else is that they are in the right. Well, one of the reasons I'm also here, Basil, is that I'm sure you're aware of the gravity of the situation and the seriousness of this investigation. I certainly am, given that you've been arrested for these crimes. And there are more, no more serious crimes than murder. There's murder anyway. That's right, you killed somebody, correct? You killed three people, actually. The way in which Basil refuses to uh, have his actions defined as murder shows how what he's done is driven by this revenge narrative. The thing when a revenge narrative is activated, when a revenge narrative develops, is, is that the actor genuinely believes that he is in the right. Everything that he then does is justified by what has been done to him previously. It becomes a mission to rectify that, to right the wrong that has been done. So, in terms of Carol and Anastasia and Natalie, would you say you killed them or murdered them? I killed them because they were not innocent. You could see a kind of angry, self-righteous, deluded vindication going on there. They were guilty. I was innocent. It's a pattern that remained consistent with him. I done nothing wrong. Basil Berutsky is a kind, caring, God-fearing human being.
When he talks about himself in interview about being a nice, kind, God-fearing man, again, that's denial. And he's trying to convince himself that that's what he is. All importantly, he's trying to convince the detectives that that's what he is. That probably somewhere deep down inside him was somebody who once was a kind, caring man. Now, three women are dead because of you. And there's reasons for this. Whether you not, whether or not you care to acknowledge them or not, you're putting words in my mouth again. Yeah. Well, it's, it's entirely up to you whether or not you care to acknowledge that. And I don't think that the people in this community would appreciate me ignoring you having taken the lives of those three girls. What was done to you if the community that hurt you so badly know, that you had to If the community things? wanted to know, they would start an independent inquiry, look into the past. How did it ever evolve to get to this? He is killing these women because he has been their victim. And it is a kind of righteous revenge. As the interview progresses, it becomes clear that Baritsky is not willing to accept any blame for his crimes. He's determined to paint himself as the victim. Playing the victim is a common ploy amongst killers, and they claim victimhood for a variety of reasons. It allows them to justify the abuse of others, and also serves as a coping strategy for them when they're under pressure to reveal the truth. As a means of justification, Barutsky frequently tries to hide behind his religious beliefs, but his interpretation of the scriptures is as flawed as his logic. But little by little, the interviewing detective is soon able to start extracting the facts of what happened on the day the women were murdered. The very fact of which means any defense Barutsky has constructed in his own mind is utterly preposterous. Like I said, like this is a difficult road you've chosen here. Why are you doing this just to prove a point? Uh, is there not some other way? All these women here that have slighted you or, or lied to you in some way, cheated on you, and you've killed them all. So I don't know what happened. I was reading the Bible the night before. If you go to my house, there's three Bibles right on the coffee table. When he was interviewed by the police, it was almost like he was giving a sermon, preaching a sermon. And he talked about religion, he talked about the religious aspect of his life and what was right and what was wrong in his own mind. He talked about the crimes, but he performed almost like an entertainer, if you like. He'd got this audience in the room, interview room with him, and he knew that this was his opportunity to tell everybody what he was all about and what his own beliefs were. I hadn't slept in days, everything was going anywhere, but and I was talking to the crisis people and trying to get help and somebody, I need somebody to talk to and nothing, I got no one. Well, to know that you've done nothing wrong. All I remember was going to sleep, or I don't even remember going to sleep, and then I woke up. I remember God's helping me do what's right. I remember I remember God saying, not saying God never spoke to me. I remember thinking. Basil says that he hadn't slept that night at all, and he claims that really he can't remember much of anything about that day, except for driving to Carol's lakeside cottage, repeating Our Father and Hail Mary over and over again. I jumped. Saying, God, keep me safe. And I remember thinking that God is really helping me because when I went to Carl's, Carl walked right outside. When he got there, Carol came out of her cottage and she saw Basil, and the two started to have a bit of an argument. He went to the house to confront her 
because he felt as though she'd been unfaithful to him during their relationship. I said, why do you hate me? She says to him, look, Basil, this isn't you. This isn't you, you know. But he, he still pursues her. She locks herself in the, in, in the uh, property. She closed the door. I was right there. And then I broke the window with my elbow. And I reached in and I locked the door. She's not able to appeal to his better side. He's, he's, he's obsessed with the fact that she's cheated him. <laughs> She says to him, leave me alone, I just don't want you in my life. He explodes. And once he was inside, Carol really had nowhere she could go. He broke in and then saw TV cord cable and managed to put that round her throat. And it was a, a cable While she was immobilised, he then strangled her to death with it and left her body there for the real estate agent to find. It's possible, this is speculative, that the intimacy of the strangulation perhaps dissipated some of the fury in him, but I don't know. Perhaps it was too personal, perhaps it uh, caught him up, but that doesn't really explain why he would then go on. Did you take the gun with you to Carol? Yes. I took it everywhere with me then, until I dropped in the bush there. In a sense, using the, the gun against the other women was a more violent act. I don't know why I did it that way. I don't know what the significance of any of that was. He then immediately jumps in the car with his shotgun. He stole her car, and then during that journey from that house to the next venue that he was going to attend, which was another partner, he drove there and he was saying Hail Mary's and he was praying to God and, and said that God was there with him and helping him do this. I remember I was confused. I remember seeing the Our Father and Mary over and over and over and I was driving. He just felt now that he was on some kind of vendetta almost, that he was going to clear the world of these people because they were the guilty ones, they were the people who'd lied and betrayed him. And I'm not religious. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm not religious. I am spiritual. Spiritual? I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. This isn't the basil I know. Do you buy any of that? I don't believe these behaviours can just magically appear overnight. But the manifestations of them are are new and, and unique in, in his life. And there's an element of disassociation in terms of his description of what occurred and, and how he felt. So he's separating out what actually occurred to how he's interpreting and feeling and dealing with the consequences of that upon himself. But he's still denying personal responsibility. He is not saying, I did, I shot, I pulled the trigger. He's saying the coil went round her head, the gun went off. These are techniques that he's using to distance himself from the horror that he's just engaged in. Sure, hence the disassociation. And what about this incredible amount of justification that the detective who's interviewing is having to wade through? We have to remember that interview is a process that you start at one point and it can lead at a different point. So people go through um, different stages of emotions, they go through different levels of, of recalling and, and where he started off by, by minimising completely um, his involvement and seeking to justify it. But I just want to go back to the idea of him saying, God keep me safe. He was saying uh, prayers as he went. This is a man for me who feels he's on a mission. Sure, yes. I mean, that's what he states at, at the moment. But let, let's just see what, it, what he continues to say. See whether he continues with this um, line of thinking or whether it alters as the interview progresses. Okay, next clip. Uh, Anastasia came along. Well, I knew Anastasia way longer than Carl, but I treated Anastasia like a daughter. She was a friend. She lived in my house with her boyfriend. He has the critical additional 
humiliation that the woman has now taken a new boyfriend. He comes out of jail and they, they humiliate him. She went back with her boyfriend and she's laughing. She does all this to me. She even sit on my lap. He said, Basil, it's psychological. She's more like your daughter. And the trigger here was his ex-girlfriend sitting on the knee of another man, which would have been like a, a red rag to, to a bull. And he took that as a personal insult, even when she said, this is the new boyfriend. This is a classic profile of someone who is effectively a variation on a domestic killing, a kind of retaliation, revenge killing towards women who have rejected him. He drives about half an hour to Anastasia's home and it's actually at this time that her sister is visiting. And her sister says that she heard Anastasia scream. And she heard a scream that Basil was there and he had a gun. Anastasia with a shotgun. The poor sister has to flee, and here's the shot. And he shot Anastasia almost point blank. I asked Anastasia, I just said, why did you lie in court? And she said, I didn't lie. I never hit that woman. And it got off. Why couldn't she just have said, I'm sorry, and I'm sure not able to stop? It's interesting, he has apparently claimed that he was a kind and caring individual. And I find that fascinating because his history doesn't support that at all. From 1977, when he was quite a young man, all the way through to 2010, it is a chronicle of abuse of women. As far as we know, he, he had something like 14 criminal convictions, including violence against Anastasia, one of his uh, victims. It is a chronicle of assault occasioning actual bodily harm, domestic abuse, assault, threats to kill. He had a tumultuous relationship with a wife for 26 years, during which he threatened to kill her and her children. Yet he ended up with a very short prison sentence and ended up spending only a few months in prison because he spent quite a long time on remand. He was supposed to attend a Living Without Violence program, which was for people who've got a history of domestic abuse. He never turned up for any of that. There were a number of parole restrictions on him. He wasn't supposed to drive. He wasn't supposed to go to certain towns where one of the victims lived. He ignored all of that. He had already been banned for having a firearm for life. The victims themselves were warning the police. There were threats to kill. There was sufficient evidence there that this man was a serious risk of killing, of extreme violence, and those warnings went unheeded. I think without any shadow of a doubt, this was always going to happen in his life. There was going to come some point where that volcano that had been building up and simmering and simmering for years and years throughout his life was going to explode, and it was going to be catastrophic. Nobody fucking listens to me. Nobody helped me. Nobody. And I was not mine ever. Nobody. Michael, what I'm interested in in this case is do you think it's domestic violence that's driving this case? Or do you think we should see him better from through the lens of being a spree killer? I think it's sort of interesting to explore whether this was spree killing or not. You mentioned in the beginning, could this be domestic violence? And somewhere it's in between, because normally with spree killers, it's a, a random assault against people that you don't really know. He knew the people that he was killing. It was very deliberate. It wasn't random. And um, he just perpetuated those killings against three key people in his life, as he now says in this, because he thinks he wronged them. Now, I'm not sure whether that is spree killing or not, or whether it's linked more to domestic violence and justification of a violent act. 
but it's an interesting one to, to explore in terms of definitions around domestic violence and definitions around spree killers and their um, victims. In normal instances of domestic violence, it's all about control and power, and the abuser ordinarily likes to continue and keep that going because it gives them that satisfaction and that security. It's all based down to insecurities. What we're seeing here isn't a domestic violence scenario. What we're seeing here is somebody who has developed a much deeper angry narrative, vindictive narrative against women, believing that he's been wronged by women and now being driven to seek his revenge. So it's, it's an absolutely horrific morning. I think in terms of domestic abuse, it's probably the worst day in Canadian history. The early part of Barutsky's police interview is characterized by an attempt by the suspect to obfuscate and justify. It's little more than a rant against the authorities. The interviewing officer has to exercise extreme patience as he listens to this diatribe. And patience is perhaps the most important virtue a police interviewer can have. Gradually, Barutsky begins offering an insight into the logic behind why he became a spree murderer, allowing the investigating officer to piece together his actions on the day that led to the deaths of three innocent women. He went to a third house and committed another murder, again by shooting. He drives to Natalie Warmerdam's property and once again murders her in cold blood. Natalie was home with her son that day and her son has been too traumatised to speak about the events that unfolded. What he told his sister was that he had heard his mum scream. He ran out of the house as fast as he could, knowing who it was. And as he ran out of the house, he heard the gun go off. Now it took police an hour and a half to bring him back from the woods where he was hiding because he was so fearful that Basil was going to come after him. What happened when you went to Natalie's farm on Tuesday? I just drove in, walked in the door. She was sitting there. In the corner, I followed her. So, walked her. That's it. During conversations with serial killers, many of them tend to speak in the third person. It's almost like they're telling the story like they witnessed it or they're reading it from a book. So, they'll classically say things like, the gun went off, or I then saw, or this then happened. So, the story that they're telling is not really involving them, they are a witness to it. They do that because they can't accept responsibility. They don't want to think of the act that they've committed is attributable, attributable to them because in many instances it's vile, it's a horrible act. So they don't want to be seen as somebody who could commit something like that. Once the act's done and they've been caught and are being interviewed or, or just having a discussion about it in prison, these people don't ordinarily want to be associated with it at all, which is why when they recount it, it's all done in the third person. It's always done as though somebody else committed the crime and they witnessed it. Actually, there is some veracity in people who have committed extreme acts of violence saying that they felt themselves detached from that. That's actually true, a physiological distancing, a kind of emotional and psychological distancing. You do feel detached. It happens, it's repeatedly recounted by various murders I've, I've interviewed down through the decades. But it's also a vindication, it's also part of the mitigation of culpability. It wasn't him that did it, it was this other self who was driven to this kind of momentary insanity or derangement, again, by the, the unfair persecution of, of others. And it was funny, it was like I wasn't even pulling the trigger on the gun, the gun was just going off, it was just like, boop. Boom, walker. That's it.
Well, uh, a lot going on here that's worth unpacking. He is acknowledging, but of course he's still clinging to the, the straws of techniques of neutralization. The gun went off is different to saying, I pulled the gun. Of course, he strangles his first victim and then shoots the second and third victims. But saying the gun went off is diminishing his personal responsibility, is it not? Well, this is the starting point. So shall, shall we see how the interview um, unravels and, and what he then goes on to say? Very cheaply shot, is it? What do you mean? What part of her body? I have no idea. She, she ducked down the line. And, it's because she lied. It would have stopped right there, but she still lied. The interview is quite extraordinary, really. How somebody can, in one, mor in one morning, chase down three innocent women and kill them, and then sit there and say, I did it because it, they made me, it was their fault, defies logic, belief, sense, whatever. I mean, it's just mind-boggling how anyone could think that. He's got this worldview which is all about himself. He rationalizes it, he, uh, he dissimulates what is happening to him to see himself as the victim. He says so in the interview that in fact these were just treacherous, lying, deceptive women and that ultimately he was doing what they deserved. It's a classic paradigm of um, a domestic variation on the domestic killer. The police tracked Basil down using signals from his cell phone and they found him. He was almost waiting for them to come and get him. Again, he's justifying himself to his brother in these texts while the police are circling above, saying, you know, if they'd listened to me, this wouldn't have happened. It wasn't me, it was all them. And he's just quietly taken in. What does surprise me is that he then didn't commit suicide. I would have expected with all that violence, anger, frustration at the world, he would then say, I've got my revenge, and then top himself. He had this belief that he'd been wronged by the three victims, and he felt as though he needed to gain some satisfaction from revenge, and by doing what he did, once that had been achieved, those three people had been killed, nobody else was really in any danger. He'd achieved what he wanted to do, that was what was all over. The act had finished, and he just sat there waiting for the police to find him and arrest him, and then quite literally opened up to the police about the way he committed the crimes and why. So one of the reasons about here is to give you this opportunity to explain why you killed these three girls. You're putting words in my mouth. Which words am I putting in your mouth? What did you say? Well, I can't really put a question in your mouth when I'm asking it. When detectives are interviewing a suspect uh, who they believe has killed, they are listening to the person. They're not judgmental. They sit there and they will look at the offender. They won't show any signs of horror or disdain at the actions when he's recounting them or anything about his life. They won't show any sort of emotion. So they're sitting there talking to him and it's almost like a conversation, if you like. Once the offender starts talking and opens up, it's then just a matter of getting in there with the right questions so the information you need is there and can be used in a court of law. In my career, I've not spoken to one killer who woke up that day and decided they were going to go and kill somebody. Virtually every single one of them found themselves in a set of circumstances beyond their control. And they reacted, typically poorly, and something happened. It's also been my experience that people say they don't care what other people think. That's usually not true. Everyone cares. It's human nature to care. Quite often, killers are either put up a very stiff opposition to what the police are questioning, or some of them treat it almost like a confession, going to see the priest and confessing their sins. It's amazing how much people will disclose once you show a genuine, connected interest in what they're saying and give them time after they've made the initial disclosure to expand. That's crucial. And then gradually, as they disclose more and more, it gives you latitude to inquire as long as you take them at a speed that they can go at. All these women used to put you through the ringer over the years and used you. 
And they're all connected, they all know each other. They've given you such a hard time. Why do you feel you needed to take on this burden yourself to prove this point after all this suffering you've already gone through? Why do you feel you needed to take on this burden? A number of themes interest me from the clip. And of course, we've got to remember that, I, I mean, you and I have sat in front of men like this for too many occasions in our careers. And the key thing that we've got to do with somebody like this is be patient. Because even though we might feel morally re repulsed by what they're telling us, they're going to reveal, perhaps for the very first time, because they've got a captive audience, further and greater details. Sure, and, and in terms of spree killing, whilst it may start, as perceived justified killing against somebody who has wronged them or a number of people have wronged them it then escalates into into random personnel he never escalated it beyond the, the the three people that that he killed and that's an interesting fact if one wants to use the descriptor of a of a, of a spree killer what's interesting is he wasn't a serial killer he's what we call a spree killer a spree killer is somebody who kills several people in one episode and we know in this case, he actually killed the three women within a couple of hours. One of the things about spree killers that separates them from serial killers is that most spree killers want to get some revenge. It can be revenge on individual victims, as in this case, or it can be re revenge on society in general. With spree killers, you tend to find that there's issues throughout their lives that they internalise. They don't deal with things like normal people would. Spree killers tend to take things personally, and as I say, they internalise it, and it's almost like it's a volcano that is bubbling beneath the surface. So the behaviour over a period of time starts to become a little bit more erratic, a little bit more random, if you like, but then one day they literally do wake up that's when you get the, the carnage that normally happens. And one of the characteristics of spree killers is they kill and then they aim to commit suicide, either by putting the bullet in their own head or, as we call it, uh, suicide by cops, where the, the uh, cops actually shoot him in, in the process. Interesting, in this case, he talked about committing suicide. He suggests that on a couple of occasions. Yet, when the police came after him, he actually asked for them not to kill him. During Barutsky's trial, he remained silent for seven long weeks as the horrific details of his murders were revealed. But his voice was heard in the form of his taped confession, which was played in the court. The jury listened intently to passages of his confession that Sergeant Kelly O'Neill had so masterfully extracted from the accused on the day after his arrest. Barutsky looked on impassively as he described in his own words how, in reference to Natalie's murder, I just drove in, walked in the door, she was sitting there, she went around the corner, I followed her. Boom, that was it. Gasp could be heard when the clip of him described how he broke into Carol's house and strangled her with a TV cable coil. His long record of violence against women culminated in these shocking murders. And the analysis of his police confession gives a very clear understanding that this is a man with a complete inability to accept responsibility for his crimes or recognize the extreme hatred and misogyny which guided his desire to kill. I didn't feel that what's happened to these women that do you understand how what's happened to these three women is, is wrong? Yeah. Would you take it back if you could? Of course you would. The fact that he said, when the detective asked him at the end of the interview, you know, do you wish you hadn't done it? And he said, of course I do. I don't believe that. I think he would have still gone out and done what he did because it had been building up in him. It had been there for years and years and just sat waiting to explode. How many men have said, 
Yes, I do regret it. No, you regret getting caught. That's as, it's as simple as that. I don't think he regretted what he did. I think he feels a kind of perverse vindication in what he did. I think it probably gave him an immense release when he did it. His profound regret is that now he is going to be punished for it. That's as simple as, it, as that. Well, if I'm hearing what you're saying, there's a purpose to this killing in the burden that you're trying to take on to change society. You've killed them all to make this point that the justice system doesn't work. And that road you've chosen is going to have consequences. So what I'm saying is with all the suffering that you've already done to this point dealing with these three women, you know, why, why are you taking on this, this, this burden to draw society's attention to it by yourself? When you get murderers, in particular, or serial killers, they always have to have some kind of get-out clause, if you like, somebody, somebody that can blame. And it's almost always a faceless individual. It's almost down to the establishment, the authorities. It's all down, very broad remit, but it's all blame. It's leveled at those sort of people. Natalie took advantage of the system, and Anastasia took advantage of the system because the police had built me up and do, it was just so easy for him. He believes that the OPP, the um, Ontario Provisional Police, were against him personally, rather than recognising that he had criminal behaviours and it was their responsibility to deal with that. And quite clearly, he tells us how he's brooded on the way the police have treated him for many years. Do you think it's a little bit selfish on your behalf to take those women's lives for you to prove a point. Selfish, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, well, these women that you killed is part of a grand scheme to draw, for you to draw light on the fact that the justice system apparently doesn't work. No, it's not a scheme. Where are you getting this from? There's no scheme. If society's against you, you've then got to make yourself sound very reasonable and uh, very, Accepting, and that's what he's done. He's trying to make himself sound very kind, gentle, accepting person. So therefore, it can't possibly be his fault. It must be the police and the authorities and society in general. Everything has been taken from me. You lost by the police and people that use the police. Why do you allow people like me to be in jail, rot in jail, and then you get out? and you're stigmatized and you live your life. You have no idea what it's like. You have no idea what it's like. Michael, we're in full avenging narrative in this final clip, aren't we? He's blaming the criminal justice system as a whole, he's blaming the police in particular, and then, of course, he's blaming the three women he kills. Crucially, he's not blaming himself. No, no, I think this is the start of, of a long process, either an interview or if you're wanting to, to work with him therapeutically with, within a prison setting, you'd want him to move him from this position where it's sort of total denial and blaming everybody else to an acceptance of responsibility for what has taken place. And you and I have seen that in the work that we're engaging with offenders, that offenders can start at one point, but actually as you work with them, as you talk with them, as you get them to understand a bit more about what's taken, taken place, then they gradually start to um, share a little more about how they actually think and how they actually feel and begin to accept responsibility um, for their offence and, and their actions. But this is never a quick and easy process. But Michael, there will be literally hundreds of thousands of men like Basil Barutsky in Canada who feel that somehow they didn't get the rub of the green who feel that somehow the community, the criminal justice system, the police have ganged up on them and unfairly treated them. Sure. But those hundreds of thousands of men don't take the lives of three women. Absolutely, so you'd, so you'd be wanting to find out, well, what were the triggers for him? What actually caused him to do that? Barutsky was sent down for the murders and is destined to spend the rest of his life in prison it's where he belongs. Why? Because his police confession 
clearly demonstrates that he's a man with a complete inability to accept responsibility for his crimes or recognize the extreme hatred and misogyny which guided his desire to kill.